Scott, you there? Of course. Hadn't heard anything. He's like, silence us. Want to make sure something hadn't disrupted. <laughs> no. Yeah, we got some people logging in already. We got Mike Wiesner and David Samard and Norm Hughes, Harold Locke. Some forces we are familiar with. Wind makes the clouds drift along. The moon helps drive the ocean's ties. And something is causing the galaxies to rush away from each other. Researchers believe the something that is pushing the universe apart makes up 70% of the fabric of the universe. But they're literally in the dark about what this something is. And so they've taken to calling it dark energy. People are, are using the term uh, dark energy basically as a placeholder um, to describe any explanation for why it is that we seem to be seeing the universe's expansion getting faster and faster. It's very exotic. It's very strange. And the strangest part, right, is that it's 70% of reality. 70% of the stuff in the universe is this thing that we just do not understand at all. If you're starting to get a little uneasy about the fact that two-thirds of the universe is unknown, rest assured, scientists out there are looking for answers. I, mean, I think I was, I was one of those kids who always uh, thought that we should know how the world works around us, that you know, here, we, here we live on this earth and, and we don't fall through the floor and somebody should have given us an owner's manual about how, how the whole thing fits together and how you use it. In 1998, Perlmutter was part of one of two teams that discovered the expansion of the universe had started to accelerate 7 billion years ago. But what exactly does it mean that it's accelerating? First, you have to understand the universe is infinite, not an easy concept to grasp. Look, you're not going to be able to picture this very well, but just imagine 
that you are living here on a galaxy and there's galaxies forever going that way and there are galaxies forever going that way and there are galaxies forever going that way in all directions, nothing but galaxies, no end. You can go for as far as you want and you'll find more and more galaxies. And just imagine that there's sort of a typical distance between those galaxies. And the only thing I mean when I'm saying that the universe is expanding is that we're sort of pumping extra space between the galaxies. And when we say it's accelerating, we just mean that that extra pumping is happening faster and faster and the, and the distances are growing bigger and bigger more and more quickly. So how did Perlmutter's team figure out the history of the universe? They did so by looking at the light from supernovae, stars that exploded billions of years ago. Hey, uh, it's looking good. We've, um, uh, the weather's good, the telescope has uh, been released and we're- Sitting in a room at the Berkeley lab, Perlmutter and Physics student Hannah Swift are connected to one of the world's largest telescopes, the Keck 2 in Hawaii. Their plan for the night is to confirm that five supernovae, previously identified through another telescope, are the type 1A supernovae they need for their research. The type 1A supernovae explode in a very similar way every time. And so they brighten like a fireworks and then fade away, but they reach the same peak brightness. Their predictability makes these exploding stars what researchers call standard candles. Their initial brightness is constant, and it grows fainter with distance. And since researchers know light always travels at 186,000 miles per second, they're able to calculate how long ago these supernovae exploded. When a supernova explodes, the light starts spreading out in all directions, uh, much like the the, uh, Ripples on the water will spread out when you drop a pebble into the lake. Uh, the you know, range in which we were studying the supernova to see the acceleration uh, was so far away that the light was uh, coming towards us from a time where the clouds of gas were coalescing into what became our solar system. So as the light from the explosion was traveling towards our galaxy, our solar system had time to develop. Dinosaurs had a chance to come and go. And we humans made our grand entrance and had time to build our telescopes. As the star moves away from us, one other thing happens to its light. Because the universe is expanding, the light waves stretch. While the light is traveling to us through the universe, the universe is expanding. And everything in the universe that's not nailed down expands with the universe. And that includes the very wavelengths of the photons of light that are traveling to us from the supernova. If the object is moving away from the observer, it will appear red. In astronomy, this phenomenon is known as redshift. One way to visualize these stretching wavelengths is to look at how waves of sound, which are similar to waves of light, change. Can you hear how the pitch of the honk changed as the sound source moved away from you? This is because its wavelength is stretching. The same happens with supernovae's light. Now with these two ingredients, the brightness of the supernova and how much the light has been shifted towards the red in its appearance, you now can just read off the history of the expansion of the universe because the brightness tells you how far back in time any given supernova event occurred. The red shift, as we call it, tells us how much the universe has expanded since that time. And now we just do this for 5, 10, 20, 40 supernova at different times back in history. And they, one after another, tell us for each time in history how much the universe has stretched since that time. I think I'll do the following. I think I'll start another explosion when this is complete and then look what it, see what it looks like and then I'll abort it if, if well, depending on what, what it looks like. Okay. But even though astronomers have become the historians of the universe, they can only speculate about what's causing this stretching. One one example of a a slightly more exotic explanation could be that there's extra dimensions in the universe beyond the three dimensions that we're aware of of space and the one dimension of time. It's possible that there are other dimensions that we just don't usually experience. Perhaps in some way we're limited to the the dimensions that we experience, um, but that other things, like perhaps gravity, could not be uh, limited, and maybe it can seep in to one of these extra dimensions. And that would make it look to us as if it was becoming diluted, that you're having less effective gravity, and perhaps um, that's one of the reasons the universe could be accelerating. Or the accelerated ex- 
expansion could actually be caused by a new form of energy. This dark energy might be the missing force that sheds light on how gravity, the force that works on a large scale, fits in with the forces that bind atomic particles together. Could this undiscovered form of energy be the key to a unified theory of everything? Researchers say that the only way to discard the inaccurate hypotheses is to come up with an ever more precise history. This will require observing more supernovae up closer. To do this, Perlmutter's team has designed a satellite that would carry a telescope more powerful than the Hubble into space. Well, hello, everybody. It was nice chatting with you uh, uh, as we were watching uh, the videos here. Uh, you are watching, I think it's the 73rd episode of First Light Chronicles uh, with uh, Ken Martz. Let me bring Ken on here with me. Here we go. Ken? Well, hello, you? Scott. I'm good. <clears throat> good well, to see you like talking to each other in your office so good good to see you man good to see you too good yeah. to see you too so um today's program is about uh using binoculars on the sky and uh uh you know i know i asked the audience uh you know how many of them like to use binoculars for astronomy and i think most of the audience does uh, regularly use them i think you know uh i think that a, a good pair of binoculars is like an essential tool of astronomy, you know, because you can quickly grab them, you can survey the sky, you can find some faint fuzzies with them, you know, and it makes it easier a lot of times to just see what's up there, get a feeling for what the sky quality is like, you know, and then, uh, you know, dive in, dive in deep with your uh, Dobsonian or, you know, get your, um, you know, your telescope lined up for an astrophotograph. Or, but, uh, or dive in deep with a pair of binoculars. Or dive in deep. There's some people that just only use binoculars. Yep. Um, I have friends that have bought those zero gravity chairs. I don't know if you've uh, you've had those, but I'm going to bring it. I'm going to bring out a couple of those to the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party so that people can experience what a zero gravity chair is like with you know, and then just hand them a pair of binoculars and let them you know suck soak up that uh, Milky Way light. Um, as I mentioned, I think it was yesterday that, uh, we were out at, um, Oracle state park and with Mike Wiesner and we were checking out how dark it was and, uh, you know, can't, I don't think you're going to be disappointed at all. Uh, it was a beautiful right. park. Um, it, uh, was really, really, you remember how manicured the Karchner cavern spark was yeah, very 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 nice yeah. okay well that's that's what oracle's like as well it doesn't have all the buildings it doesn't have the uh the uh you know the theater inside and all of that but it's also not kind of as crazy busy as karchner was you know so that's that's a good thing um and uh so you know you're going to kind of have this uh, peaceful experience out there under the stars and even during the daytime and, uh, you know, as Mike Wiesner often says, you know, Oracle is this gem out there in Arizona that uh, people are still discovering. So, Scott, you took an SQL meter with you, right? Sky we, quality. I, brought, I brought mine, but I, I, I didn't have to use it. Mike used his. Oh, so okay, Mike had his. Okay. We got a 21.2 reading at around, it was like 8 or 8.30 or something like that. It wasn't even dark yet. You know, yeah. and so, so it's, it's and, the, and the meter there. only goes to 22. 22 is like utter darkness. So here at 21.2, uh, you know, we were seeing the zodiacal light. We were seeing uh, Milky Way uh, really prominent. And, um, you know, it was nice because Orion was still it was it was up high in the sky. We could see uh, lots of cool things, even with a pair. I have a I use the Montana. Uh, eight by 25 binoculars, you know, those little mini binoculars. And I could see through 25 millimeter binoculars, I could see the curve of the Orion Nebula, you know, the Orion Nebula where it looks like it's wings coming out. I could see that. 
that. Okay. Wow. So that was a real indication. I mean, that's not much aperture, you know, one inch of aperture. And uh, I was already seeing that kind of detail in um, Orion, you know, uh, picking out Andromeda was, of course, a naked eye object, um, seeing it with uh, even those one inch binoculars, it was stretching across the entire field of those little binoculars. So, you know, you get into a bigger pair of binoculars with more aperture. And now that all these things really take on another dimension. So, all right. So, you know, um, we were talking a while ago, um, I have uh, used my binoculars and, and I probably, if I went back through my paperwork, could get the binocular, full binocular Messier. The Astronomical League offers an observing award for members. Mm -hmm. uh, and to get the binocular Messier, you have to observe at least 50 binoculars with 50 objects with your binoculars. Uh, and uh, I actually did knocked it out in one night uh, at the Winter Star Party back in, oh, 2000 or 99 or 2001, something like that. Todd Longnecker, a good friend of mine, uh, were down there and we knocked out the Messiers in one night and just bagged them. I think we ended up getting like 60 or 70 that night. Uh, and we had the 50, so that's what we got. Um, very enjoyable to under mm -hmm. good skies to not have a lot of kit to fuss with. Um, and you know, we, we got into the Virgo cluster and we could not, and I think I've told this story before, we could not sort out the Virgo cluster because we couldn't find all the guide stars and the, the, the guide stars were just out of place. And yeah. then we finally came to a realization, so huh? So many stars. Well, we finally came to the realization that the guide stars we were looking at in the binoculars were actually yeah. were actually the Messier objects, all the M objects in the Virgo cluster. And so we were we finally realized, oh wait That's a minute, good. Yeah. <laughs> those aren't guide stars. Those 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 are the constant those them be them yeah, be the M objects. <laughs> those them be galaxies. And you know we struggled with that for a while, and uh, you know but uh, got that award. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and sadly have it, it's about record keeping, right? And, and at the Sugar Creek uh, Astronomical Society, the, the club I just retired, or, uh, left my two-year run as president, um, I was presented with a uh, uh, Astronomical League uh, Outreach Award. And, you know, uh, Paul and Kathy are the coordinator, and, and uh, they said, yeah, you've done enough, and they went ahead and turned me in for it because I haven't kept the records really but they uh -huh. knew stuff that I'd done. And so they made up the record and turned it in for me. I just need to go back and dig through my records and, and finish my Messier objects. Oh yeah. Uh, There's with no the telescope. telescope. I, mean, you I know, know just, you, just to do it. You, you've done so much in educational outreach, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, enjoy doing it. And, and here's my trick. I've showed this before, but I'm going to show this again. And here's, here's my trick on how to really use binoculars really really well I'm trying to get this earphones to stay on do you have uh, to have an explore scientific cat for this if you have one you'll see more oh, okay yeah so most people just hold binoculars up yeah like this right sure. and you know you you can put your elbows in a technique i used when i was doing photography hold your elbows in to your chest and put them up against your brow up, above your eyes mm -hmm. and that gives you a lot of stability yeah <clears throat> but one way to really boost this is to get a fitted cap or a snapback this won't work with a stretchy cap but it'll work with a snapback let me see if i can do this there we go you bring them up to your eyes yeah and you grab the bill of your cap nice and yeah so now you got a lot of you're, you're cutting out even more stray light right well you're cutting out stray light but what you're doing is now your binoculars are locked to your head and every time your heart beat, your hands don't move and you don't mm -hmm. wiggle around. So everything's locked in. I'm still pressing up and pressing up against the top of my eyebrow <coughs> or my eye socket, but I'm also grabbing on the bill of my cap. And now everything just stays locked to your head. And miraculously you can see a magnitude or a magnitude and a half better simply by doing that. Because you see so much more, uh, it, the it's sharper, clearer stuff isn't moving around. 
the binoculars on around, and that's how I do all of my binocular observing now is, is that cap trick. Um, it, it's, right. it, you don't have to hold them up because you're now the bill of your cap is holding them up and the thing on your head is holding them up. And so you get longer viewing time on top of that. So what do you have there? Is that a pair of Montanas? Oh, no, these are these are the Alpen Tetons, which are really okay. some of my favorite binoculars. But one of the things I wanted to point out is that in between the binoculars, mm -hmm. there is this little threaded knob. It's almost on every pair of full-size binoculars. You're not going to find it on the minis, but uh, you'll see that there's a hole there. And that is quarter 20. And there's an adapter. It looks like an L bracket. It I'll screws it. into the center there. It comes down. And then it's an L piece like that. And then that whole thing fits on a photo tripod. So, you know, you can really, you know, if you're not going to handhold them, you're going to be aimed at one part of the sky for a long time uh, um, or one region of the sky. It's nice to use a uh, telescope uh, or a um, camera tripod for it as well. So, um, and that is also something that you want to take advantage of if you're doing birding where you're watching a nest or something like that, or a bird feeder, for example, um, you know, having them all set up is great, but. Um, so, yeah. So here, so, here, here it is, Scott. Um, right. There you go. Yeah, there you go. So, so go. what oh, you can't see down. in that image, uh, what you can't see in that image, I don't think, unless you, you're showing kind of the bottom of it. There it is. That's see? attached to a tripod. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. So that's attached to a tripod right there. And this is an Alpen tripod adapter. You can see the price, 20 bucks. And a great tool, uh, especially if you're out doing birding and, and, and for long term and out for hours on end, uh, these <laughs> can really make your, your evening much more comfortable. You know, yes. Now, they're not like using a parallelogram mount or anything like that, which we don't have. <clears throat> but they're out there and those are always nice because you don't have to hold them up. And if somebody wants to see what you're looking at through the magic of, of uh, uh, geometry yep. and trigonometry geometry, you can lower them down to somebody else's height and they can still see at the same exact thing you're seeing. So that's a pretty cool mount. So anyway, but yeah, that's the adapter for those. And they're very handy uh, for binoculars on, a, on any standard tripod mount so um you know i have never owned a really good pair of binoculars <clears throat> until you know i got here and i've bought the uh uh the hs version the these hs 10 by 42s these are 10 buys yeah these are the 8 by 42s really yeah. nice pair of binoculars pretty affordable uh you know ed coated uh, really nice binoculars. I always like to do this. Let's see. Can you see? Can you see my eyeballs? <laughs> is that important? Yeah, lost in the black holes of those glass, you know, the glass. There yes, I go. can see them. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, always fun to make your eyeballs yeah. look really big in binoculars. Right. Jim Norwood says on a show a couple of weeks ago, you guys mentioned how much the optics had, have advanced in recent years. You suggest if we were still using uh, older instruments, we should upgrade. My Minolta 10 by 50 seemed pretty sharp, uh, but do you think I'd notice a difference with more modern set today? Um, Jim, that, that has a lot to do with, uh, you know, how well those coatings were. Um, coating technology has increased quite a bit over the years. Um, uh, you know, and Minolta, uh, you know, did purchase, I mean, they, they didn't make their own binoculars. They purchased from companies that made them. Uh, you know, we are closely aligned uh, with uh, a binocular, you know, uh, our parent company is uh, manufactures and designs binoculars, you know, so that's, uh, although we do use a number of different factories for that, uh, simply because, when you're selling binoculars, often uh, orders can be quite large and you have to have manufacturing capacity for that. But I will tell you, I, you know, I've been in factories where they're making the binoculars and they are all built by hand. I mean, it is amazing to watch them put them together, you know, to install the prisms, 
uh, to put on the rubber covering, you know, the, which uh, creates a sculpting of the binocular, to put on all the little parts, it's actually quite complicated because you got two eyepieces, you got two telescopes, you got prisms that you have to align, okay? And uh, then they, you know, almost all of these that are better quality are uh, argon or nitrogen purged. So you have to purge them. You have to test the purging, okay, with, by dunking them in water. Once you've got them out of water, now you got to clean them, okay? And, uh, and then the packaging and all the rest of it. So it's very, very labor intensive to make a pair of binoculars, um, uh, you know, and so hence the, you know, as you start to go up in um, the quality of the optics, they can get quite expensive. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Well, one thing that, 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 you know, there are special tools made for each model of the binocular to yes. get those prisms in their position exactly right. And that tool that gets made is only for that binocular. That binocular. Does, doesn't work on if you've got a, like I've got a Model 82 Alpen, if you put them on a Model 84 Alpen, it's not going to work. It's a different tool. And there's all this special tooling that gets made for each individual operation to assemble and align. And, you know, yes. that's that's an expensive part of it as well. Right, right. So, uh, you know, when you're, when you're uh, trying to learn, you know, to find the right pair of binoculars for you, I, it's something kind of like going and trying to find a pair of really nice shoes for yourself. You know, you want them to, um, you want them to be really comfortable, you know, m maybe I should say more like technical shoes, you know, like, uh, shoes that you're going to hike in, uh, explore with, um, uh, those kinds of things. Like if you go to a, uh, a, a store where, you know, you have outdoor gear, uh, those shoes, you know, that you're going to have to wear them to hike miles and you want them to be really comfortable. Well, if you do a lot of observing with the binoculars, the same deal, you want the sculpting to fit comfortably in your hands. Uh, you want, um, you know, uh, all the eye comfort you can get. Some people are really, really picky on how the uh, focus wheel works, you know, how stiff or how loose it is. Some people like a real loose wheel so that they can spin it to a, uh, you know, one range of focus versus the other. I prefer a more smooth, sticky, slow kind of wheel because I like to sneak up on focus and just kind of leave it there, you know, and I don't like it to be easily knocked out. Um, uh, binoculars uh, also offer uh, adjustment between, you know, one eye to the other so that the the way that you start off with binoculars, you pick them up, you adjust what's called the inner pupillary distance. This is the distance between your eye. And so you're going to adjust this so that the exit pupils, let me see if I can get, there you go. You can see the exit pupils now, okay? Uh, the exit pupils line up right over the pupils of your eyes, okay? So that's you want to get that? That's going to look like a circle, right? Yeah, it's it, like it it's up, the it's beam of light circle. coming out of the eyepiece. It's the same with the telescope. You have exit pupils on telescopes too, uh, you know, and um, a lot of binoculars also have uh, uh, eye cups. Some of them are just spin up continuously. Some of them have lock positions. You know, I like the ones with lock positions. Um, uh, this has a right eye diopter setting. So what you're going to do is you're gonna start off with your eyes, both eyes open, real, real comfortable, and you're gonna close off the right side. You're gonna to come to focus until it's sharp, and then you're going to come over here and you're gonna adjust the right eye diopter, which is right here on this particular binocular. On some other binoculars, it's a separate wheel, uh, like right, right in front of the focuser, or sometimes a separate wheel right in front of the, uh, um, you know, the bridge up here. So, uh, but you get, you get that part focused and then you look through both eyes, you might touch up the inner pupillary distance again, focus, touch up again, maybe right eye adjustment one more time until you just nail it. Okay. And you'll see it. I mean, things get real sharp. And then at that point, you're ready to start observing. You know, it's a skill it takes up a little bit to master how to, I always, I found if I squint, I think that changes the shape of my other eyeball. So oh, I got, yeah. to, I got sure. to hold my hand over the end 
and keep both eyes open. Uh, That's right. So, so I'm not squinting to change the shape of my eyeball. Yep. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's see, read some comments here. Um, lots of people here have binoculars. We were kind of talking about the weather a little bit, you know, just unseasonably warm day here in the United States uh, for the most part. Um, Norm Hughes says he likes looking at the Milky Way with binoculars. Uh, let's see. Jim's Astro says, I keep mine right by the back door. Uh, looked at M42 last night with 10 by 50s. So the, on binoculars, that first number, when I said 10 by 50, 10 is the magnification that the eyepieces are giving you. Okay. But 50 would have been the diameter of the objective lens. And of course, just like on any telescope, because this is just two telescopes tied together, the larger the aperture, the more light's going to hit your eye and the more resolution you're going to get. And that's where you get distance and detail. And that's what we're all after is distance and detail. Um, but what it, Kent, you're a birder. How important is the focus range of a binocular? Well, I wasn't a birder. I mean, you know, I wasn't actively, you know, going out and doing it. But since we, we launched on the wing of the Thursday show, I have become a, an active birder. You know, and building on what my parents, you know, had given me a love for when I was a kid. Um, you know, um, you wouldn't think that having close focus is important, but a lot of times, especially if you're holding still and, and where birds want to be, you know, you can be focusing seven, eight, nine feet away at a bird. And uh, especially if you're inside a house and really trying to observe the bird, you know, nine or 10 feet away becomes really important. And not all binoculars can focus that mm -hmm. close and so that becomes a consideration now dan george our friend that you know uh that helped us on the on the wing and probably will be doing it again here in march or april um that uh you know he 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 says the eight by 42s are the sweet spot for burning binoculars eight by 42 yeah that's what Some he likes people like a little, little bit more magnification but uh, that focus range uh, I've always heard it's real important, you know, um, uh, if you want to get in close to a nest or if you want to look at something uh, real close, like maybe um, butterflies or dragonflies, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. So uh, we do have, you know, when you look at uh, binoculars of different designs and stuff, and we have a really broad range of binoculars, um, some of them focus as close as like six feet, something yeah. like that. So crazy, crazy close. Right which is kind of fun to look at the world around you at six feet away, you know, with all that resolution and all that yeah. image brightness, you know, so. Yeah. A little bit more than arms leak away, but binoculars change your perspective. Amazingly. It's mm -hmm. always interesting to see that. Right. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, to kind of answer the question about the Minolta 10 by fifties, it's worth doing this. It's worth uh, uh, going, taking them to a star party, comparing them maybe against some of your friends' binoculars, that kind of thing. A lot of amateur astronomers uh, see the value of investing into really nice glass, you know, because they're, you know, like like an audiophile that wants really great speakers or a great amplifier or whatever, you know, you, really nice cables for the sound, you know. Tel telescope users get to be what I call optical files, you know, where they want the best glass that they can afford, you know, uh, because it just adds to their enjoyment of what they're, what they're doing. So, you know, and one piece of advice about, you know, take your binoculars. If, if you don't have them, go to a star party, go to a binocular store, go to a sporting goods store yeah. and just compare yours. Oh, yeah, go and to just, Cabela's, Bass Pro. Yeah, Bass Pro, exactly. Have a ton of binoculars on display. Yep. I have noticed that even like Walmart will carry a bunch of different binoculars. Um, so you can you can ask to, uh, you can carry your old pair in and just kind of look at something across the store. You know, compare, you know, look at shadow areas, look at bright where you got bright lights overhead and see, mm -hmm. you know, how much flare uh, invades the field of view, you know. Uh, really good binoculars are, you know, great baffling, great coatings, 
the prisms are, are done right, all of these things. And you'll, you'll notice it right away. This is not something that you're really going to have to spend a lot of time doing. And if you don't, then don't buy new ones. It's that simple. That's true. If you go, mm, it's not worth an extra whatever, then right. don't, well, don't you'll do see. it. You'll see what your threshold is like. But 50 millimeters in binoculars, I mean, that's two two-inch refractors, okay, uh, put together. That's pretty good, you know, so... Um, so I think that, I think that, you know, you, you could definitely use them for a long time. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, Frank Ryan Jr. says, uh, he's watching on YouTube, he says, parallelogram mounts are great for public viewing events. We stick a big pair of 25 by hundreds on them and it's uh, super fast to adjust for different viewers. That's true. Uh, Kent, why don't you share your screen on some of the giant binoculars that we have uh, in our lineup? Actually, sure. it's just kind of like this year or maybe last year that we started getting into the uh, real giant binocular um, business. Yeah. So, yeah, and it's been um, fun and we're sold out. You know, this is crazy. So, yeah. In fact, it's just a little bit more than a year ago. It popped up on my Facebook timeline. Uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. I might be able to find that picture, but. Uh, here we go. Share this real quick. There we go. So, you know, the pictures don't do them justice because you've got the 70s and the 82s and the 120s and the 100s. The pictures really don't do you justice. But these are two 120 millimeter telescopes side by side. They come with uh, eyepieces. Uh, yeah already uh to go so you don't even have to buy any matched eyepieces all right i'm gonna quit sharing here let me see if i can find this picture on facebook um i didn't share it it may be hard to find um that really shows the scope of um the binoculars so i can't remember how to get to the history of the photos. This will take forever to find these. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Lubo says, I got a Celestron binoculars for free with my telescope purchase. And when I tried them, I understood why they were for free. Okay. No. It is possible. It is possible to get some mediocre quality binoculars. Uh, you know, less expensive binoculars have the prisms kind of like just cemented in, you know, and if they get knocked out, uh, they, they get out of alignment. <clears throat> uh, that slight misalignment will give you a headache um, because your eyes are constantly compensating to get the, both images that are, you know, in a misaligned yeah. prism, you're going to see double images and your eyes can force it together, but uh, you can't look through them for a long time, you know. So Scott, yeah, here's a here, you know okay I so that, that day. yeah those the pictures I showed of the 120s yeah because here's here's the 120s just in picture right it just right. not not impressive at yeah, all you don't get a real feeling for how big they are until you switch to it won't give it to me come on there we go Facebook all right there we go. now you understand how big these are. Right, that picture yeah. does not do it justice. And right. uh, you look at it, and we had uh, Nick, our box maker, use some of the solar film we sell to make a custom uh, solar filter for the binoculars. And when we get these back in stock, we're going to offer those for sale as a product. Uh, but you could really turn any pair of binoculars with that solar film and that kind of configuration into great solar binoculars. Uh, so. Uh, we've also engineered that it's sitting on a pier that uh, Alex made, one of our, our, our engineers here made, and, uh, you know, it makes it higher up and, you know, easier to use. We expect to get some of these back in maybe midsummer, uh, along with the, the cradle mount that it goes on. But the views through this of the sun was spectacular and because you're using both eyes they're effectively in um you're seen in three dimensions 
and you know uh, everything up in the sky looked three dimensional when you looked at this stuff because you're using binocular vision. It was really a cool effect to see uh, the moon, the sun. I don't remember what we were looking at. Uh, I, we probably went out and looked at Orion. Would be my guess. Obviously, it's a beautiful day. Um, you know, because we uh, February twenty second was when this picture was posted. And that was mm -hmm. the same day. So basically just barely more than about a week and a half ago, um, we were out doing that and uh, just beautiful. And we sold through them really quickly. You know, we didn't have a big number and uh, they proved to be very popular. So uh, those will come back into stock and hopefully we'll be able to get some out to people to, and they're beautiful. They're beautiful to look at. They're great to use. So uh, they are spendy, you know. Yeah, you know, big binoculars are like that. There was a question in the chat about, uh, they said, you know, uh, Scott, it, it looks like two straight through tubes. Are there any prisms in this? And the answer is absolutely yes. You need a prism uh, built in to flip the image right side up and also left to right correct. Okay, so uh, that's what makes spotting scopes, spotting scopes and binoculars, binoculars is they do have these prisms that give you an image correct view, okay? Um, so the type of prisms that are in here, these are called roof prisms. And it's a complex set of prisms, uh, a lot of surfaces that they have to get exactly right. And um, so this is another aspect that a high quality prism, especially a roof prism, will jump the price up of a binocular because of its complex nature. Now there are, other binoculars that have, you know, like the traditional binoculars, where it looks like the barrels are on, you know, displaced from the eyepiece where it kind of comes like so. Um, and those are called poroprisms. Um, and poroprisms uh, are, some people like the way that they, they hold in their hands just simply because they're bigger. Um, uh, a lot of uh, naturists, birders, stuff like that prefer this kind of binocular because for the same reason, it fits in their hands better, it's lighter, it's smaller, it's easier to carry around. Um, but uh, one advantage of a pearl prism binocular over these is that because the, the lenses are separated wider, you do get a little bit more of a three-dimensional effect, okay? Uh, but all binoculars are going to give you that. Um, so when you look at the moon, for example, it looks like a ball up there, okay? It doesn't look like a flat uh, view that you would uh, sometimes get that impression by looking through one eye. Uh, the other effect is that bright stars look closer, faint stars look further away. That's a really cool effect that you see through binoculars. The bigger these binoculars become, uh, the more that effect is enhanced. So um, Scott, I've downloaded a... Uh or took a screenshot of the differences between the prisms. Sure. That I'm trying to get up. Here we go. All right. So this is always. There we go. So there's a nice design of them. You can see this is the roof prism. And the prisms are right here, if you can see. And there's, I believe five, is that right? So there's one, two, three, four, five reflections to get it upside, right side up and correct. And it goes yeah. through, it goes through one, it only goes through three surfaces, but those prisms reflect back. And that's where those special coatings on those prisms, um, you know, high tech coatings to get that perfect reflection off of those prisms. And as you can see over here on the Poro, it just goes in one prism, comes back out, a zigzag, uh, does the same thing. These Abbey prisms make for a much more compact binocular. I'm not Abbey prism, but roof prism. And right. most, most roof prisms, uh, the really good ones use what's called Abbey prisms, A-B-B-E. I yeah. presume that's how it's pronounced. Yeah. Uh, that uh, a very, very specific design to control the re internal reflect reflections yeah. in those prisms. So now the other thing that, that's very important, of course, we've talked about coatings on on, mm -hmm. on optics and stuff like that. And you can see very subdued kind of coating that's on these. 
uh, binoculars here. Uh, the same goes for the eyepieces. These eyepieces are edge blackened, um, like our high performance eyepieces are for telescopes. Uh, they, uh, uh, the interior, you know, the interior of the binoculars is, let me see if I can show some of that. It's hard to it's see it. Black. Because it's, so, it's so dark, but there are baffles that are inside of here that further make it dark. You know, it's capturing stray light and subduing it. So it's really dark. And um, the other thing you want to do with binoculars is you just grab them like this and you try, you see that if you move it back and forth, if you feel the body like shifting around, okay, or if it's got a bridge uh, towards the back here and you can grab it and move the eyepieces around, that's a problem, okay? Uh, those, uh, when you get them out of the box, sometimes right out of the box, they're already out of collimation because you know, UPS is bouncing them all the way to you. Um, but if you have a you know, high quality body construction, that's gonna, that's gonna help out quite a bit. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I mentioned that inexpensive binoculars also have cemented prisms in there. A lot of times those prisms are undersized, okay? And you're not capturing all the light from the objective lenses. So that, that is, uh, you know, it's a way that you can cut corners if you're trying to make a very inexpensive pair of binoculars. So when I say inexpensive pair of binoculars, I'm talking about binoculars that are, you know, $150 or less, okay? Doesn't mean that you can't buy a good quality pair of binoculars for $150 or less, but you need to check them out, okay? Um, you know, uh, typically binoculars that are in the $300 to $1,000 range, you know, they just get better and better and better. Um, uh, when I was, uh, when we were in Oracle State Park, and I noticed that there were some hardcore birders out there and they were all carrying Swarovski binoculars. Uh, between the two people wearing Swarovskis, it was about $5,000 in binoculars hanging around their necks, you know, just in those two binoculars. But um, Swarovski gets it right. They put in the right kind of coatings. Uh, they have the right kind of body construction, the right kind of prisms, all these things. We do all those things as well, but, uh, um, you know, we don't charge the extraordinary prices that Swarovski does, you know, so, um, yeah. but, uh, and there's, and we're not the only good binocular manufacturer out there that's in this range. The other thing is, is that uh, some of the top quality binoculars use the types of glass that top quality binoc refractors use, and that would be ED glass. And you can see a big difference between an ED pair and a non ED pair. And Scott, all of these, especially our high end binoculars, are fully multi coated, meaning oh. that, yeah, talk yeah. about that a little bit. Well, fully multi coated means, you know, if you bit, go and show the illustration again uh, where you show the prism. Oh, uh, hang on just a second. Gotta go back to it. I did save it. So, and I even know where I saved it. <laughs> Sometimes progress is small things. And downloads? Uh, nope, put it in my. I have a folder called DDDDD. That's where I just put. D -D 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 -D. That's just, I just type something real quick and that's where I just stick random stuff, right? Here. Uh, while you're trying Here you to go. find there we Okay, go. there we go. Okay. So, um, all right. So you see, if you look at the objective lenses, the objectives on, in this illustration are down on the bottom of the oh, illustration. Sorry. Okay. So you can see a three element air spaced uh, uh, system right here. This, the one on the right is a two element air spaced design. Um, and you can also see the, the eyepieces. The eyepiece designs are, uh, some of them are three elements. Some of them have more elements than that. Okay, because they're trying to correct things like barrel distortion or pin cushion uh, distortion that can occur uh, in any eyepiece, but uh, especially you see them in binoculars. Um, uh, the, uh, but fully multi-coated means that every lens where it touches air, so you can see the air spacing between there, it has coatings on one side that's touching air. And then if the other side's touching air too, it's coated there as well, okay? So that is, uh, that's very important. Um, uh, you know, uh, that they're all coated like that, because if you leave a lens element uncoated, 
let's just say that you coat the outside elements, which sometimes are done on very inexpensive binoculars because again, they're trying to cut corners. They don't have to coat all the lenses on a cheap pair of binoculars, okay? Um, you know, you see that you can see the coatings on the front and the back. You think, okay, I'm good. But then you notice that your friend's fully multi-coated binoculars are, have a lot more contrast. The images appear a lot brighter, okay? Color fidelity is way better, you know, these kinds of things. And then if you go to look at fully multi-coated and then you have ED glass, the ED glass reduces chromatic aberration or almost eliminates it. And so again, the color fidelity, the contrast goes way up. You're starting to notice really fine details, you know, uh, it, things look super real to you, okay? Um, and then, uh, you know, the, uh, of course the eyepieces, if you're an astronomer, you know how important eyepieces are. Uh, same, same rules apply to the binocular. Um, so that those are those are things to uh, consider in binocular construction, um, and also more expensive binoculars have the ability to adjust the prisms. Now I don't recommend this is something you do yourself, but Explore Scientific actually has the collimation machine for binoculars. Okay, so we can set down a pair of binoculars. We know where to get to the prisms. We can adjust those prisms in a precision way and send them back to you. And we've done that not only for binoculars that we sell, but other brands as well. And Scott, you said the people that run the collimation machines in the factory are among the best paid employees in the factory because it is a skill that you just can't just right. go do. Right. Right. That's right. So, so we, maybe, uh, maybe you got to be good. Video. You got to be able to, you got to be quick and you got to be precise, you know, yeah. so. You know, here we don't have to necessarily be quick because it's not a uh, production <laughs> right. situation. But uh, we might do a video one time and show people how we collimate those when they Absolutely come in. Absolutely should. And yeah. all of our any any even from our low, the high side of our low end inexpensive binoculars are waterproof, meaning that they're Nikon purged or Nikon nitrogen purged and mm -hmm. sealed. So they're not going to fog up internally. <laughs> they may fog up on the outside, but you're yes. not going to get that that maddening internal fogging because once they fog up inside, that moisture is there and you can't get it out. And when right. conditions are right, it's going to fog up on the inside surfaces and you're done until the conditions cause that moisture to go back into to the air. So uh, what are the conversations we got going on? Well, Lubo is wanting to know when we're going to get into night vision eyepieces. Um, you never know. I mean, we don't have anything on the immediate horizon about them, but we're certainly aware of night vision uh, electronic eyepieces uh, that can be used. Um, I'm, I've used them. I tend to like a real view, you know, instead of a, an electronic view, you know, but uh, there are some objects where uh, night vision intensification really does help, you know, and can really boost uh, the effective light grasp of your telescope. So that that's something to consider. I know that Teleview makes one. Um, it's uh, they're, they're kind of expensive, but uh, but if you like it, it's certainly well worth it. Uh, Thomas Morgan says he has Celestron binoculars. What are my thoughts on them? I think they are great. Thomas, uh, Celestron's offered all different kinds of binoculars from very inexpensive to uh, very high quality. So uh, depending on what model you have, you know, how they're built, all these things, um, you know, that, that makes the difference. So uh, Explore Scientific also has in their range of binoculars. We have binoculars that sell uh, in mass market and uh, they are less expensive. Uh, we even have children's binoculars. So we've, um, we've got, Scott, we've got some six by 21s yeah. that are fabulous binoculars. They are, they are. For like those are 30 bucks. Honestly, God, real binoculars too. They're not, uh, you know, with the full on prism, they're made like modern binoculars are made. Uh, yep. But we also have Galilean binoculars. They're like four by 30s. They have no prism in them, you know, and give a right, left or right, uh, correct view. But uh, the field of view is very narrow and all the rest of it. And they sell for like, I don't know, five bucks, something like that. So, um, uh, but you, you're going to get what you pay for. And for the amateur astronomers that are watching here, you know, they're going to want something 
I think generally that's going to be on par with uh, the kind of optics they're using in their telescopes. So, yep. You know, uh, like anything else, buy the best you can afford. Yep. You know, because you're going to get what you pay for. Yeah. Chad Tolley uh, is watching on YouTube and he says, has Explore Scientific ever considered image stabilized binoculars? Chad, uh, we have looked at image stabilization. One of the things I have to tell you is that Canon has many, many patents on their image stabilization uh, uh, designs. And because of that, uh, they have the most compact uh, user-friendly image stabilized binoculars on the market. If you're going to buy image stabilized, I highly recommend the Canon line, you know, so uh, you're going to find great optics, uh, great image stabilization and all the rest of it. Um, and they are nice because you can handhold them and I've used them. They're wonderful. Um, but again, not, you know, for the amount of money that you're going to spend on image stabilization, you could throw that money into better optics, you know? And so, it's it that makes that's a choice, you know, uh, per dollar spent. But the people that that uh, use image stabilized binoculars, for the most part, love them. So, yep. You know, I've it, I think we sold a pair at one point. It seems like or, of Canon binoculars. No, of, of image stabilized binoculars. No, we've had samples here before. Okay, uh, all right. Stabilization. Okay, I know. So I... Uh, they were more. Uh, they were more along the lines of like uh, what Fujinon offered, okay, where they're they're like poro prisms, but they're large, you know. And so, um, you know, to get around the patents and everything, you can't do it. You can't just copy Canon, okay. Uh, you you would have to come up with something novel. And uh, Canon's got a lot invested into their their uh, image stabilized design. That's the reason why you don't see them from Nikon and you don't see them from Minolta and you don't see them from some other companies, uh, uh, simply because of, uh, the, uh, investment that Canon has put into design and patents. And the whole point of it is when you have that, you come up with every single idea you can come up with for ways to do it. And you patent all of them to protect yourself from, other people doing it. And I'm sure that's what they did. Now, Lubo so. saying that Nikon has some image stabilized binoculars. I'm going to take a look right now online about them. Yeah. And these are the large ones. Um, again, they are, they're not as uh, compact as what uh, Canon's offering. They're kind of a more boxy looking, you know, kind of design. And so, Probably pretty good optics, but uh, the uh, the stabilized uh, fourteen by forties are um, are available from Canon. I noticed they have like a side strap, so you can hold them better, you know. So, um, but worth checking out. So, yep. You know, binoculars for astronomy, great tools to have, quick, easy. They're also good for other things. You want to go bird watching with them or you go watch sports with them, you know, check out a boat on the river. You know, there's, they're, they're multi-use. They truly are a, a multi, very flexible use uh, investment. That's more than just a singular thing. But let's, let's come back to binoculars and astronomy uh, and the astronomical league. Do you have, um, uh, do you have the uh, uh, observing program there, Kent? Or what do you mean? Um, uh, I'm sorry. The the observing program from uh, the astronomical league, just so that people can get a feel for so what's it's in just, there. It's literally just go view fifty messy objects with binoculars. Uh, with binoculars, any size binoculars. Okay. You view fifty. Right. It, it's about record keeping. Write down the date, time, location. Uh, and just uh, today I'd, put, I'd do it in field notes and then put it into a spreadsheet and, you know, a quick description of what it looks like. And that's all that's required. You know, the whole, the whole goal of the Astronomical League observing programs is, taught, is to not make it difficult to do. The goal mm -hmm. is to get people out there observing, right? Yes. Now, you know, 
when I did it, what, 15 or 20 years ago, had been, well, over 20 years ago now, I guess, because um, it would have been back in, I don't know, 2001, two, and somewhere in that neighborhood, um, you know, the skies were darker. There wasn't as much light pollution. So it becomes more of a challenge for people because you more and more people can't see the, the Milky Way. They can't see the stars. Those faint fuzzies that were easy to see 20 years ago become harder. And I'm launching into my campaign about light pollution. We also need to be dark sky warriors and uh, uh, talk about light pollution and, and, and act locally um, and fix your porch lights and then talk to your neighbors about theirs and go from there. You know, it's not going to go away until some of us get active enough to change personal individual habits. It's a habit is all it is. It's an addiction. I saw two cars, Scott, going home last night. Um, I saw two cars driving down uh, a street, and it was so bright that they didn't even realize they didn't have their headlights on. You know, and it's like doing we- like, that happens in cities all the time. I know. You know? It's like, and, and now it's happened to me before, you know, before, I mean, like my vehicle now, if it's dark, they automatically turn on. But uh, back in, in the day when you had to turn on your headlights, okay. Um, uh, yeah, it was, if you got into a bright area, it's pretty easy to forget that you don't, you know, because you really don't need them. You can see, you can read a book outside, you know, with, yeah. with all the, light pollution, you know, so that's, that's that the, you know, of course, having your lights on is a big safety factor, you know, so that other people can see that a car is there, you know, so it's just scary. That can be that bright that you can drive along and not realize you don't have your headlights on. And and that, that begs the question, is that really too much light? Is there, is it necessary to turn city streets into daylight illuminated roadways? Right. Yep. Uh, you know, um, apparently a lot of uh, city planners think so, you know, so a lot but, of people uh, think all light. kinds of reasons why a lot of lights thrown on to city streets uh, and a lot of those have to do with money, you know, mm-hmm. so and who's who's going to be making money from doing that. So that's that's the deal there. Uh, driving through the uh, dark areas of Arizona. Uh, last weekend, I made this stretch from um, from Oracle to uh, Phoenix, and I went down this wonderful dark highway. It was great, you know. Of course, you can see all the other cars, you know. It's not a problem. Um, but uh, you know, I, I pulled off the side of the road a couple of times just to look up, and it mm-hmm. was just glorious, you know. So, um, and I know that wildlife really appreciates. Uh, you know, a darker sky. So that's probably why there's such a major bird corridor going through that region as well. So when you guys get to Oracle, if you're going with us to the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party, uh, you're going to see a lot of wildlife, a lot of birds of all different kinds. It was just really uh, amazing. The number of birds that we saw there during a hour long meeting that we had there um, at, uh, at Oracle State Park. What, what all did you see, Scott? Did you take notes? I didn't take notes. Well, I was taking notes of what the people were saying in the meeting and stuff, but there were like these bright yellow birds that were there. Uh, uh, there was, um, we saw a, uh, some uh, hawks that were there as well. Um, so it was, I did get a nice shot. I'm going to have to show you a picture that I took of, uh, you know, this hawk flying from this branch. Uh, and you'll be able to tell me which one it was, but. Uh, uh, was it a, uh, just with your iPhone? Or yeah. Did, okay. Just a snap. Yeah, but he iPhone. was close. He was really close. So you know that's what's good. Uh, Carl Bernhardt, if 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 you watched it on the wing, he has really been digging into his archives, and he's going to 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 parks and locations where the birds are acclimated to human activity, uh-huh. and he is able to get amazingly close to some beautiful birds because he's going out to. Um, locations where the birds let them get close as opposed to you know wild birds are acclimated it can be a challenge sometimes to get close enough to birds 
but he's gotten some really pretty pictures that we're going to be seeing over the next next few episodes. Um, yeah, he's he's really been shooting us a lot and uh, looking for people down in Florida. Need somebody in Florida to start sending us some Florida ocean birds, and uh, we we want to see um, people submissions from all over the country and all over the world because that brightens all our data to these beautiful birds. Yes. Yep. It's true. It's very true. I was trying. I I should have thought about the uh, about finding the. I'll, I'll have it ready for tomorrow. For you, Kent. To cool. Yeah. Share. Okay. Well, don't, don't make me ID it live on air. I want to see it first. But, uh, okay. All right. It's a hawk. It's a sparrow, uh, guy. It's a sparrow hawk. Yeah. It's a, it's it's a sparrow. Hawk. It's a it's a it's a bird hawk. It's a red-shouldered <laughs> sparrow-tailed falcon hawk. Yeah. I will have right. to. Uh, um, I'll bird up. I, I will bone up on my hawks of on the your southwest. Hawk knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Hawks okay. of the southwest. Okay. Cool. Well, anyways, uh, that was kind of our show. We wanted to go over binoculars with you today. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're looking, you know, to upgrade binoculars or whatever, uh, I can tell you just from all the different manufacturers, it's well worth taking another look, uh, no pun intended. Um, and anything else you'd like to add today there, Ken? Nope. You know, um, nope. Let look, me see for, look for, here's one thing I want to add. I said no and immediately started talking. Yes. When you buy a pair of binoculars in this day and age, you need to be looking for a nice wide neck strap, right? Those, ah, yes. those narrow, thin plastic neck straps of your dad's time are long over with. This is a stretchy, soft neoprene. It's going to hang on your neck and not dig in. It's got a it's got an anti-slide stuff, so you put it on your shoulder and it's not going to slide off. This is a critical component I think people sometimes forget about because, you know, it's, you don't think about that neck strap, but I can remember the neck strap of dad's binoculars just digging into your neck after half an hour or an hour. And, you know, pay attention to little details like that because those little details make your binoculars better to use. So um, that's, that's my last parting shot. Okay. Well, good. So Scott's typing, it looks like. Well, yeah, there was a question, somebody asking a customer service question here. Uh, Thomas Morgan says he has a National Geographic 700 uh, millimeter telescope. Unfortunately, the legs broke on me when I was outside one day. Does your company make a base that would fit this scope? Um, Maybe. It's possible. It's possible. So I'm just recommending that you jump on our website uh, go down to the bottom Here. of the page and uh, set up a share that, uh, share that link real quick, quick Scott. I mean, that'd be an easier thing. No, that's true. Yeah, let me get, let me get in the link. It's really it's, easy. Uh, it's explore scientific dot support sync dot com s y n c dot com explore scientific dot support sync dot com. And when you're on that page, you're going to click submit a request. It. Yeah, you'll click submit a request, and that'll open up a, a window where you can talk about what's, you know, tell us what's going on. And then one of the customer service reps is then able to uh, talk back with you and go from there. Right. Yep. And I just posted that. So uh, Lubo says, take inspiration from guitar straps. That's true. Actually, maybe even use a guitar strap if you have a yep. pair of binoculars, you know, um, probably a loaded question. You sell Alpen XP and ES G600 with uh, similar specs for the same money. Which would I recommend? Ken, I'm going to give that to you. Say it again. Read that again. You sell an Alpen XP and an Explore Scientific G600. Those are the new Explore Scientific binoculars. Haven't compared um, them. Haven't compared them. Can't, you know, they may be nearly identical ultimately you know i can tell you that uh i did take home uh those binoculars mm -hmm. and really enjoyed using them uh going back and forth i haven't done that yet with the alpins I haven't um, either. but uh you know the ones that i'm still really really blown away by is those tetons with the abbey prisms 
you know, uh, one of the, the other, uh, I forgot to mention this, these Alpen, the, the ones with the Abbey prisms have a, uh, a metallic uh, enhanced coating that's on the prisms that makes the prisms brighter. Okay. They reflect more light through. So mm -hmm. when you look through these binoculars, you are going to be, especially if you can compare them to a pair that don't have that kind of coating, you're going to be knocked out by how bright they are. It is really great. You know, especially mm -hmm. low light levels, especially for astronomy. Um, I think it's, you know, we've, great. we've, we've done things like with the same binoculars, new generation, right. But the same binoculars side by side, and it's remarkable the difference between them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I'm not, not dodging his question. It's not something I've done side by side, so I can't compare them. It's something we can do for, for next week. Well, we can do that. And, sure. and, and talk about it. do a side by side comparison. Yeah. Just write that down, Kent, the Alpen XP and the ESG 600. And we'll, we'll weigh Alpen, in. Alpen XP. Uh huh. Looking to see what those varieties are. Uh, those are 10 by 42 and 8 by 56 are what we have. So I'm going to go with the 10 by 42 because although the 8 by 56, we have a pair. So we've got both of those in the. Yeah, let's compare them both. So we'll, we'll compare them both. We'll do a field test. Mm -hmm. I think the sculpting on them is going to be a little bit different. So that's a preference as well. This gets into the touchy feely range of which ones that we compare or which ones we like. It's like asking, you know, which eyepiece, you know, do you think is better? All right. Mm -hmm. This is really boils down to, you know, unfortunately, when you're comparing optics like that, you don't have the other person's eyes. You don't have their eyeballs. Right. Okay? Right. And their retina. <laughs> And, and all their defects that they have in their eyes. Okay, right. we all have them. All right. And their cones and rods may process light differently yeah, than that's, yours. That's do. part of the equation. You're not a machine looking through this. All right. You're a human being looking through them. And there's, there's, uh, you, so, you know, when people are trying, uh, the, I will tell you that when you are uh, reading uh, uh, about different eyepieces and uh, visual systems, okay. Uh, if someone's coming across like they are an absolute authority, okay, uh, and and say this is a definitive performance measurement, uh, I'm always very skeptical of that because I've seen people with uh, different, uh, you know, from one person to the next, uh, uh, prefer one thing over the other, you know, so you can put out five binoculars, five high quality binoculars out there. And when the, when the nuances are very tight, okay, it really boils down to what that person, how it fits that person. So, mm -hmm. which is why it's important for you to look through them. Right. So. Okay. It's time to wrap it up. It looks like. It's time to wrap up. You guys have, oh, I did want to mention, um, uh, we had planned to move Global Star Party from Tuesday to Thursday, uh, you know, we, we were working with Cesar Brollo uh, as a special guest host. And uh, today I uh, got a call from Cesar and he did mention that his, uh, uh, that he had an illness in the family and that he had to take some time to deal with that. Uh, Cesar himself is absolutely fine, but uh, uh, for those of you that know him and watch him, but, uh, um, but so he's got a show that he's going to do on telescope optics on the global star party. And we're just kind of shelving that for right now. And then when he's really ready and can focus on his presentation and have all of the speakers come on, you can also focus on the presentation. We'll do it then until that time. And we will um, uh, do the next global star party next Tuesday for our regular time slot and all the rest of it. And it's about the expanding universe. That's the theme. So, so that's that's what I have right now. Anything else you'd like to mention, Ken? I think that's good, Scott. I'm okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks everybody for watching. Thanks for the great questions and comments. And um, we will see you guys tomorrow. Take care. Bye, everybody.